Oh, good. Uh, well, good. Is it still afternoon? It's an afternoon, no. It's afternoon, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well, thank you for coming for this paper. Um, and I've changed the title slightly. Uh, and I've put it several <coughs> Iron Ages. I should also include the Late Bronze Age because this also covers really Late Bronze Age of Denmark. And I start with Christian Christiansen, who is one of Europe's leading prehistorians. And he's written in 1998 a magisterial overview of Europe in the last millennium BC. It covers the whole of the continent, it goes between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, and draws out parallels between developments in the Mediterranean world and Northern Europe. And these parallels are very much the theme of this session. Christiansen's general interpretation is that much high status burials, high status burials are evidence of a chiefly social order or warrior society, and these interpretations are often based on parallels with the notion of a Dark Age Greek society in the Aegean. These references to a Dark Age society um, seem to be partly based on Finley. So when he says, when these elite burials with amphorae and buckets are considered, they demonstrate an astonishing similarity in burial ritual, ranging from small details such as the wrapping of burnt bones, to the Dionysian drinking rituals and the employment of standardized symbolic motifs, uh, he seems to be um, re referring to uh, Finley in some way. His general references to Dark Age society are rather vague. But again, the source seems to be not an archaeological interpretation, but Moses Finley, which I'll come to later. In one section, he alights on a number of high-status um, tumulus burials in Denmark on the island of Finan. Two of these are to be found at some are called Lushoj. Now, I ex please, I don't know Danish very well, and if I pronounce them wrong, um, on the island of Finan. And these are indeed extraordinary burials. And he has this to say about them. The ritual is reminiscent of the Homeric tradition and is known from some of the earlier Central European princely burials, such as Chaka, with strong Mycenaean influences on burial foods. And this isn't the only place where Christiansen detects Homeric burials in Europe particularly in Germany and Italy. And he goes on, so elsewhere, to say, when these elite burials with amphorae and buckets are considered, a demonstration of astonishing similarity in burial ritual, ranging from small details, such as the wrapping of burnt bones, as described in the 23rd book of the Iliad, to the Dionysian drinking rituals and the employment of standardized symbolic motifs and figures on the amphorae. But it is surely the claim that the burials at Luce Hodge are in the Homeric tradition that must strike most scholars as of being a little bit far-fetched. What is the basis for this claim? Well, both of the tumuli, there was one excavated in the, 18, in, the, in the 1970s and there was one excavated by a Danish king in the 1860s, are massive, much larger than any other Danish examples of the same date. Uh, this size of tumuli echoes the description of the size of the mound that buries Patroclus in the Iliad. In both of these Lushoj tumuli, there are bodies are cremated and associated with numerous metal valuables. In the burial excavated in the 1970s, an elaborate cremation platform seems to have been used. In the one excavated in 1860, the cremated remains are placed in a Central European hammered vessel. Now that's actually not the hammered vessel, it's just an example of a hammered vessel of about the same date that I could find uh, when I was looking on the internet. At both loose hodge barrels, there is ostentation in the destruction of valuables, where they seem to have been burnt with the bodies. Valuables which have often traveled some distance before being placed in the grave. And the loose hodge burials, burials uh, are of the same date as some in Greek I'll be coming to later. So the Homeric tradition referred to here is the description of the burial of the warrior heroes in the last two books of the Iliad. First Patroclus in the Iliad, and then Hector cremated on a pyre, their bones wrapped in a linen cloth and placed in a valuable antique. In the case of Patroclus at Golfiele, over which a mound or tumulus is raised up. We do not find burials like this in the Aegean Bronze Age, the so-called Mycenaean world, as Christiansen implies where persons were inhumed in chamber or tholus tombs over a number of generations. Inurned cremation begins in Greece at the Bronze Age, Iron Age transition around 1100 BC. An early example is tomb 201 from the North Cemetery at Knossos, where a male person associated with a sword 
seems to have been cremated with an antique uh, Cypriot bronze stand uh, and an antique um, boar's tusk helmet and the sword seems to have been deliberately broken in the burial and the antique bronze stand seems to have been actually burnt over the top of the body. The full panoply of Homeric burial practices only appears a century later at Left Handy Tumba. So here's Left Handy Tumba. Uh, this is a structure built over or we're not quite sure whether the, the burials were there first and the thing was built, the big structure here was built onto it, or the burials were built into the floor of the structure. This remains a long standing debate in Aegean archaeology. This is a double burial where a male warrior is cremated, his ashes and bones wrapped in cloth, and placed in an antique Cypriot bronze stand, a bronze amphroid crater. He is accompanied by his queen, who there's always been an argument. So this is the male cremation here with a broken sword, and here is the inhumation of a younger female who might have cut marks and might have been sacrificed if we don't quite know. Uh, and if, if she was sacrificed, this again uh, has echoes of the description of the sacrifice of the Trojan hostages in the Iliad's description of the burial of Patroclus. And eventually a mound is raised up over him and the building and the burials. And the sacrifice of horses also take place at the same time. At this point, everyone's inner sceptic will be asking, are you seriously proposing that the loose horse burials, or was Christiansen supposing that the loose horse burials were influenced either by a Junian early Iron Age burial practice or by some kind of Homeric narrative? Do you believe, either Christiansen or myself, in a Homeric tradition that spans all of Europe? Well, no to both questions. I'm not proposing such a thing nor do I hold such a belief. I would point out that Christiansen's frequent use of Homer and Mycenaean in the same sentence is something of a red herring. Mycenaean burial practices are not Homeric, as uh, Hilda Lorimer pointed out back in the 1950s. And there are few of any GM scholars now think that the Mycenaean world and the world of Homer have much to do with each other. I am, however, pointing to parallels in practice between the late Bronze Age Denmark and early Iron Age Greece, two societies which are approximately contemporary uh, with one another. These parallels might have some bearing on notions of personhood, parallel personhoods as it were. I'm not arguing for some generalised notion of warrior society or chiefs across Europe, as Christiansen seems to do, but to clarify this we have to go back to Homer, or rather to Homeric scholarship, and this is where I think archaeologists haven't kept up with what's going on in Homeric scholarship. There's always a time lag in the impact of scholarship in one field and its impact on another. One of the things that Christiansen talks about extensively is some notion of Dark Age Greek society. But again, this notion seems to be based not on archaeological syntheses, such as those of Anthony Strongrass or Nicholas Coldstream, but rather on second-hand versions of Finley's World of Odysseus. This World of Odysseus posited that the Homeric poems in general, and the Odyssey in particular, could be used as a kind of ethnographic analogy for the Aegean world of the 10th and 9th centuries BC. That an identifiable historical Homeric society existed at a particular point in time and space during the so-called Dark Age. That Homer describes a socially plausible real world rather than a fictional poetic one has always struck many scholars, particularly archaeologists, as being implausible. Attempts to rescue it, as Ian Morris did in 1986, have been based on the assumption that the Iliad and the Odyssey both assumed a recognisable textual form around 700 BC. This assumption has come under sustained attack by Gregory Nage in Harvard, who has argued that both poems took recognisable form not through some single act of composition by a single individual poet, but rather assumed a form of poems through repeated and convergent acts of oral performance by many poets in a panhelletic setting over a period of that's two centuries between um, 700 and, well, 750 and... Uh, 550 BC. There was no Homer as such, only an oral Homeric tradition that gradually assumed written form. Recognisable and partially textual versions of the Iliad and the Odyssey would only have appeared around 550 BC at the earliest. In brief, Homeric scholarship has moved away from society and the notion of Homeric society and back towards narrative and narratives of the self. <coughs> 
This aligns in some ways with prehistoric archaeology's current interests, particularly with personhood. Personhood is not a new concern within classical studies and Homeric studies. That Homeric heroes had a rather dispersed notion of the self, that Homeric heroes talk not about themselves, but about their parts, liver, heart and so forth, as the principal locus of agency, was first pointed out by the great classical scholar E.R. Dodds. Oh, sorry, this is a, more descriptions of the left kidney burial. So here's, uh, <coughs> it's not the great classicist E.R. Dodds, but it's someone quoting from Homer, um, our great foreign secretary. Um, when interviewed by a Guardian journalist in 2011 and asked about whether he had found it at all difficult being mayor of London, Boris Johnson said, Bear up my heart, you suffered worse. But he's talking about his heart, he's not talking about him, so he's talking in the ER Dodds way of talking about the self. Now, of course, I would like, um, this also refers to ER Dodds' great um, chapter on Agamemnon's apology, where Agamemnon doesn't apologise. What he says instead is, um, I was not responsible, but Zeus and fate and that strife came through the air. They placed in my chest and counsel a vicious madness. Now, one hopes that eventually Boris Johnson will say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, maybe that's been a bit too optimistic. <laughs> but the point here is that, uh, that uh, one might see uh, Homeric, uh, Homeric persons as being permeable individuals, except that this debate has already happened in classical studies. Uh, not only E.R. Dodds, but Bruno Snell talked about uh, personhood uh, in the 19, early 1950s. So that the, the, body, the, the bodies depicted on examples of geometric art in the 8th century BC were not whole bodies, but assemblages of parts was underscored by Snell in his Einstein der Geists. Snell drew attention to what we now call the dipple on shield problem, where warriors do not appear to have bodies, but to be collections of shield, hemlock, javelin, and spear. The dipple on shield and the body are one. In brief, classicists already had a debate about personhood in the late 1940s and early 1950s, of which anthropologists and prehistorians seem to be largely unaware. I've argued elsewhere this particular Homeric notion of personhood, exemplified both by the burials at Knossos and at Lefkandi, took shape in the Aegean around the time of the Bronze Age Iron Age transition. It is connected to a gendered polarity in burial practices, which is this is a kind of diagram that sums that up, uh, which has uh, male warriors and children at one end and children at the other, so increased destructiveness, increased wealth, um, and at the apex are these sort of 35-year-old uh, women who are cremated but have extraordinarily rich burials. This individual dimension of Greek personhood persisted for a very long time. Dispersed personhood is central to Greek archaic narrative. The rise of the individual in archaic Greece, and I, can't, I don't have time to go into that, but that's just a gigantic myth. With also, all this in mind, let's return to the loose hot burials. Might such a gendered polarity of persons be evident here? One difficulty with these burials is that we do not hear you know, the sex of the deceased either in either burial, either the one in the, uh, excavated in eighteen sixty or the one excavated in the nineteen seventies. The following argument assumes that the persons were male. There do seem to be points of similarities with the loose such burials and those at Knossos and Lefkandi. In the ostentatious destructiveness of the bodies, the fact that objects have travelled some way to be destroyed, uh, and the practice of cremation. I would argue against a uh, simple coincidence. What this, these combinations do appear to be is distinctly European. These combinations of elements seem to appear at different times and places without much evidence of contact or influence between regions across many areas of Europe. Here Christiansen does seem to have a point. How do we account for this? Well, Christiansen's uh, suggestion is that chiefs who travel to faraway mythical places and return not only carry with them prestige goods but themselves become sacred and heroic. The travels of Odysseus, we've had Odysseus in the previous paper in the form of Leopold Bloom, are indeed a classical myth of this type. Bronze Age ideology was preoccupied with the ritual importance of heroic travels and the transmission of myth rituals of distant origin. But we don't need chiefs for this. 
What the whole debate about agency and object biography has highlighted is that some objects are made to travel. Um, and I would argue that things like craters, such as the Francois Vase here or the um, Vix crater here, were made with the deliberate <coughs> intention of travelling. Just as the Homeric poems, some objects have narratives attached, just as the Homeric poems might have assumed their present form through convergence, so the agency, both fractal and cumulative of the Francois Vase and the Vix crater, carried ideas from the Aegean to Italy and Transalpine Europe. On another note, the late Martin West has drawn attention to the structural similarities underpinning many of the surviving myths of Indo-European peoples. The Iliad is not the only European epic where closure is reached through the ostentatious burning of the hero at the end of the poem. There is one composed whose subject matter is much closer to Lusenhoch. Thank you.